Okay. All right, so welcome back. Uh, one thing I put in the sets break. Uh, one thing I didn't mention last time is the are these links at the top of the page. I want to quickly go through these. These are all the, the apps and services that I'll use to, uh, to interact and communicate with you all. Uh, I will be streaming on Twitch. I'm streaming on Twitch right now, so if you want to watch the lectures there, uh, you can watch them live from anywhere on the planet with an internet connection. I will be streaming uh, mic one. I will be streaming Let me fight with my audio a little bit here. Uh, so I will be streaming all three sections. There's a 1 p.m. section, this 3 p.m. section, and also 4 p.m. section. So if for whatever reason you want to watch more than one stream or, or uh, check out the 1 p.m. before lecture, whatever, you have those options available to you. I'll stream all of them. I'll also be streaming 3.12 at 10 a.m. if you want to watch that for some reason. I'm not going to create two separate channels for two separate courses, so you'll have those mixed, uh, mixed in. Our TA Mike here will also be taking the Twitch videos and posting them to YouTube. He's, he was great about it last semester, doing it same day. Uh, so if you don't want to go on Twitch, but you want to see the videos on demand, you can go over to YouTube and check those out. You can also watch all the YouTube videos from last semester if you want to watch all the lectures, if you want to get ahead of material and you're, uh, you're anxious to get up there, up further in the material, you can check that out and check out those videos. The, some of the topics are in slightly different order, so keep that in mind. Um, but you can watch all those videos right now. Then uh, Piazza and Discord, we have two apps to be able to communicate. Piazza, you're probably familiar with both of these, but just a quick overview. Piazza is going to be the more, more official channel. If you have something where you need to talk to the course staff or myself, the TAs or myself, uh, that's the place to ask. If you have questions about a homework assignment or whatever, that's the place to ask. If you need to post your code, please do not post it publicly anywhere. Obviously, that's an academic integrity violation. Uh, but if you need to post your code, you can make a private post to instructors on Piazza. That's the best way to get your answers for coding questions, aside from office hours if you want to go get live help. That's the best way to post, make a post to only instructors on Piazza. Then you can post your code. You can put whatever you want in there. Only the course staff can see it, so you don't have any AI concerns. If you want something less formal, and, uh, and the TAs and I will be answering questions on Piazza all semester. If you want something less formal, that's where Discord comes in. If you just want to have conversations, you just want to chat with other students from the class, you want to chat with alumni, you want to chat with uh, TAs and stuff. I won't spend too much time on Discord, uh, but there will be a lot of people there. There's always chatter on there. So if you want a casual environment, chatting, uh, Discord's your option for that. If you want something less formal, um, there. Uh, and more irreverent, I mean, it's Discord, if you're familiar with Discord, uh, it's going to feel like that. Uh, there's been a lot of chat already. Uh, if you ask silly questions in Discord, you'll probably get a, a little bit of, uh, the most PC way to say is, uh, you'll get teased a little bit sometimes. Piazza, if you, if you want something more formal and more, uh, uh, more uh, professional, I'll say, head over to Piazza if that's your, your cup of tea. So you have those options if you want, uh, depending on the level of formality you want, I suppose. GitHub, uh, pretty much all the code that you'll see in lecture, with some exceptions, sometimes they'll do live coding and won't post it, but they'll appear in the GitHub repo. So check out the GitHub repo for tons of examples. There's examples for, uh, for the entire semester in there. Uh, and I'll, uh, some of them will be, I just realized this, some of them will be a little out of, con, uh, out of order because they're according to last semester's schedule. So I have to reorder a few of those weeks. But there's code for the entire semester in there. Lots of examples, lots of stuff to follow. If code appears in a slide, more than likely it's going to also appear in that repo. Uh, so checking that out, um, getting that code on your laptop, I highly recommend downloading that code, um, uh, cloning the repo, and playing around with that code on your laptops so you can get a feel for how this stuff, how those examples are working. And finally, Autolab, where we'll be submitting our code. I added the, the class on Autolab, uploaded the roster late last night, so you should have access now. You shouldn't worry. Uh, some people were, some students were asking me questions yesterday and earlier in the week that they didn't have access. You do have access now. If you don't have access now, please let me know. We can take care of that. 
Uh, here's where I'm going to post all the learning objectives and application objectives. This is where I'm going to post your results for those. So there's, there's never a question of where you stand in terms of those. Whenever I go through the learning objectives or application objectives, I'll go into Autolab, I'll post your results there. So we can always be on the same page as in terms of where you are in terms of those objectives, what you have complete, what you don't have complete. Nobody should have a surprise at the end of the semester like, oh, surprise, you only had four learning objectives. You just didn't know about it because you thought I said it was complete. None of that. We're going to have model lab where we're completely on the same page. You can go there and check out what objectives you've completed so far in the semester. And today is our first lecture question. For lecture questions, you'll submit on model lab. You'll go into lecture question one, click the box that says you didn't cheat. Then submit, it's going to ask you for a file, and you're going to upload a zip file of your program. And towards the end of today's lecture, I'm going to walk through the process of creating a project, writing code, creating a zip file with that code, and then uploading to Autolay. All right, with that, any questions about, about the structure of the course or how the course runs before we get into some content? Okay. All right, jump to some slides. So let's talk about Scala. So each lecture will have a lecture question. The lecture question will always be the, oh, that's what, I, I knew I was forgetting something. Uh, the lecture question will always be that second slide right after the title slide. If you go to the course website, I'll always post the slides with this little icon. Uh, I won't always guarantee this. I'll try to get ahead of uh, the slides as much as I can. Uh, but they'll at least be posted by 1 p.m. each lecture day. That's when the first lecture is. I'll at least guarantee you have them up by then. Uh, so you can check out the PDF versions of the slides. And whenever they're posted, you can check out what the lecture question is going to be for that day. So if you, the slides are posted early and you want to get ahead of it, or if you want to check them out at one or before lecture, you have those, uh, those options available to you. The second lecture question is posted if you want to check out Fridays as well. Uh, but the lecture slides, PDF versions will be posted so you can open them in your browser. I'm going to go through the keynote version so I can have some uh, presentation uh, features. <coughs> okay. So the first lecture question, this is going to mirror a, a good amount of the 115 content, at least some module one content. Uh, but we're going to write it in Scala and write our first Scala program. So for this, I want a, a program that's going to compute some shipping costs. So writing a method that given the weight of a package, how much is it going to cost to ship that package? So, uh, and we have this function, this uh, piecewise function. If it's less than 30 pounds, it's a flat rate of five dollars and if it's over 30 pounds it's going to be a quarter per pound over 30 so five plus 25 cents per pound over 30 you can have uh, fractions of a pound the input is a double so if it's 30 and a half pounds it should cost five uh, five dollars and 12 and a half cents uh, i get that question uh, i got that question last semester so i want to make sure that one's clear uh, so code that up as a method, takes a double, the weight of the package returns a double, the cost it takes to ship that, that double. So we have some conditional in here, and we have two different functions based on that conditional, and then a return value based on that conditional as well from the method. So this is what we want to code by the end of today. So let's learn how to do that, and let's start with the classic Hello World. It's where every, program, uh, every programming course should start, right? So Hello World, first, Again, I'll run through a whole example. I'll go through the live example of creating an IntelliJ project. But, uh, but just real quick, once you have IntelliJ downloaded, once you have the SDK installed, the Java SDK installed, the Scala SDK installed, the Scala plugin installed, and everything set up, you'll be able to create a new Scala project, create it as an idea project that'll set up the structure of what that you're going to see throughout the semester. You can create a new project and then start running code, writing code in IntelliJ. There are links in the course website on the schedule for today, 
how to how to install, where to install IntelliJ, where to get it. This is the IDE that we'll use to be able to write our code. We're not using online IDEs like we did in 115. We're going to use an IDE that's installed on your laptop, and you'll write your code code locally um, instead of an online IDE. So once you have that, you can write hello world, and uh, there it is in all its glory. So this is the first Scala program we're going to look at, the first example we'll see in this semester. So let's pick this apart and look at the new stuff that we're seeing for the first time, if you haven't seen Scala or Java, it's very similar as well. Uh, for example, in Python, this would just be print hello Python. In JavaScript, it'd just be console.log hello JavaScript. But in Scala, we have some extra stuff here, so let's pick this apart and see what this extra stuff is that we have to have in order to write a Scala program. So first thing, the first thing we have is a package declaration. This is saying where, uh, what package this code is going to reside in. And a package is a collection of objects and classes. We haven't talked about classes yet, but it's a collection of, uh, of Scala code. This is, um, uh, corollary to and should, sh this is a very strong should, but it should match the directory structure inside your SRC folder. In IntelliJ, when you create a project, it'll create a folder named SRC for source, where your source code is going to go. Inside that folder, that's where you're going to write all your code, and inside that folder, you should have a directory structure that exactly matches your package structure. So for example, this program would be in a directory, would be in the SRC directory, and a subdirectory named week one, and another subdirectory named basics. And that's where this code would reside in my project structure. So we want a way of organizing our project. Packages are going to give us a way to do that, and it's strongly, strongly recommended that your directory structure match your package structure. If you're coming from Java, Java forced your directory structure to match your package structure. Scala loosens this restriction a bit, but it's still strongly, strongly recommended that your package structure match your directory structure. Just helps you organize your code and organize your project a, a lot more effectively if your directory structure matches that package structure. To create a new package, you would right click on the directory, new package in IntelliJ. Next we have what's called an object. Of course, we'll talk all about object-oriented pro programming in a few weeks, but we still need the basic definition of an object before we can even write a Scala program. An object is a, a uh, unit, I always blank on the, the right word to use here, but a unit or a block, uh, I guess block, of code containing variables and methods, uh, or variables and functions. When functions are part of an object definition, for some reason, we gotta call them something different, we call them methods in that case. So you hear me use the terms function and method throughout the semester. Most of this first, uh, until we get to functional programming, most of this first part of the course, they'll all be methods, so I'll use the word method a lot. Method and function are somewhat interchangeable, but there are subtle differences, enough that we have different terms for them. So if we define a function, what would be a function inside of an object using the keyword def for define, when we define a method, uh, a would-be function like that, that is a method because it's contained in an object. The difference, uh, the difference being that it has access to the, the object's variables makes it slightly different than a function. So inside this object, we have a collection of variables. We don't have any variables here, but we can have variables and methods. And we have one special method named the main method which is where our program starts. This is where execution of the program starts. So if we have an object in a package that has a main method, with this exact header, it has to say def, it has to be named main, it has to take an argument of type array of strings and return unit. We'll talk about what all that stuff means in a bit, um, but for now, for main methods at least, if you have this exact header, you have a main method. Scala, IntelliJ, where, uh, the, uh, JVM, whatever's running, whatever's looking at your code and trying to run it, is going to look for a method with this exact header inside the object that you're trying to run as a Scala program. Once it finds a main method with that header, 
it knows that's where the program starts and that's where it's going to execute your code. And then anything in the body of the main method, that is your program. That's where your program starts. That's where execution starts. And then here we're just printing Hello Scala to the screen. Nothing too interesting in this one. The only exception, ooh, the only exception to the main method header, args technically is a parameter name. You can rename it, whatever you want. If you change args, uh, your program's still gonna run just fine. But it's standard practice to call it args. These are command line arguments, some we won't mess with in 1.16, um, but it's standard to call that args in, in uh, most languages. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, any questions about our hello world example? No, so this is just extra structure that we have to have around a Scala program. If, you're, if you've come from Java at all, if you've done some Java in high school, for example, uh, most of this will look familiar with, to you, uh, and a lot of Scala will seem familiar to you. Scala is very similar to Java. They both compile to the JVM. Uh, compiled Scala code and compiled Java code is treated exactly the same to our machines. The, the JVM can run them both. Um, so they're very similar in that sense. They, they are built on the same platform. So you're going to see a lot of similarities between the two, if you've seen Java before. Um, if you haven't seen Java before, this is some extra structure that we need just to get off the ground writing a Scala program. Um, some, extra, some extra things. We need an object. We need the object will live in a package. We'll have a main method, and then we can start writing our program. Let's talk about methods and variables, and then later we'll talk about conditionals. We'll get through a good portion of module one today, if not all of module one, I forget exactly where the cutoff is, uh, from 115. Methods and variables. So look at our second example, and let's do something a little more complex. Let's, let's add some stuff to this and start reviewing the 115 content, but with Scala syntax. And today and Friday is going to have that theme. We're just talking about Scala syntax. You know how to do these things, how, do you, how exactly do you do them in Scala? So let's talk about that for variables and methods. So let's look at this example. If you've never seen Scala before, you can probably still trace through this program and figure out what it's going to do. You can, if I didn't tell you this down here, you could probably tell me, oh, it looks like that's going to print 14 to the screen. Confident that most of you would be able to do that. Uh, when it comes to writing your own Scala programs, that's where it gets trickier, when you have to know, okay, what is everything that's going on here? So let's walk through this step by step and see exactly every piece that's going on here, starting with the method definition. So here we have a second method. This is just like any of your, uh, any of your Python, any of your uh, JavaScript functions. We're going to define these. It's inside a, an object, so it's a method. We have this method. We, we define it using the keyword def. This would just be like the keyword def in Python. It'd be like the keyword function in JavaScript. So we want to define a function. We're going to give it a name, any valid name that we want to give it. And we're going to give it its parameter list. All familiar stuff, but we do come to our first difference here. In the parameter list, we have to define the type of every single parameter, and Scala is going to hold us to that type. Here I'm saying that this method takes one parameter, it's going to be named input, and then I have to have a colon, and then some Scala type. I say that this method takes a double. If anywhere I try to call this method with a type other than a double, or a type that can't be automatically converted to a double by Scala, I'm going to get an error. Scala will refuse to run my program. Scala is what we call a strongly typed language. It takes types very seriously. And coming from Python JavaScript, this will be the first big adjustment that you have to make moving to Scala. All of our types have to be defined. This method only takes doubles, and this method only returns doubles. So after the parameter list, similar to, to the types of the parameters, we have to define the return type parameter list, another colon, and then the type of the return value of this method. So this method takes a double and returns a double, and it cannot work in any other types. Again, unless asterisk, if Scala can automatically convert those types to doubles. But it has to work with doubles by the time this method is called. 
So this takes a double, returns a double, and it has to do those, uh, work with those two types. And finally, we have equal sign, just part of the syntax, and then the body of the method, and then the body, with, uh, just like, uh, mostly like the other languages, any other language you would see, when this method is called, the argument is assigned to the variable of the parameter, and then uh, the body is executed, and we return that one value. The one big difference, you don't see any return keyword here. There's no return statement in this method, and we really won't see return methods. You won't see any of my code, I should say. You won't see any return statements in any of my methods. Technically, the return keyword is in Scala. It exists. You can use it, but its use is discouraged. The Scala community just uh, uh, doesn't doesn't like the. I don't know the best way to say it, but but it's a standard in Scala. If you're coding in Scala, you're not really using return statements. Um, it's just the the convention. That's what I'm looking for. It's the convention. If you're coding in Scala, you don't use return the, uh, the return keyword. So, how does a method return anything if we don't have a return value? It's the last expression that's evaluated during the call of that method. So here in this method, I only have one expression, input times two. That's going to be evaluated to some double. There's nothing left to do. We've hit the close brace of the method. So that last expression, that input times two, that's what's going to be returned. Just because it is the last expression that's resolved during the execution of that method call. I'm feeling like I forgot something, but I, I, I can't put my finger on it. So variables. So that's a method definition. Let's talk about variables. Here we're declaring a variable. We're naming it x. And when we declare a variable, two things I want to talk about here. We're using the keyword var, which from JavaScript, if you've taken it last semester, maybe they made this change two semesters ago, but it's similar to let in JavaScript. So if you're used to that from 115, if that's how, how you went through 115, this is like saying let x equals 7. So var means that the value stored in that variable can change. We are declaring a variable with the keyword var to short to var. Next, we have the type of this variable. We're naming it x, and just like in the parameter list where we said name colon type, we have x, the name, colon, the type, double, and then assigning it the value 7. So here we have a variable, its value can change, named x of type double, and assign it the value 7, this variable has to always store a double. And, oh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Scala will hold us to these variable types. I briefly said this, but I want to reinforce this again. Scala will hold us to these types. So for example, in the next line, we're going to call our method multiplied by 2 with x. Scala will check and make sure that x is of type double. If x is not of type double, asterisk or something that can be automatically converted to a double, like an int. Uh, an int we get away with because Scala will just say, I'll convert your int to a double for you. But if x were, say, a string, Scala would not run our program. It would just give us an error, and it would say, I'm not touching that. You told me this method that you wrote only takes doubles, and you tried to give me a string. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to stand for that. So we have to have our types clearly defined, and Scala will hold us to those types. Scala takes very seriously with the types that we tell it, uh, that our, our variables, our parameters, our return types, whatever, value, whatever types we say, Scala will hold us to that. We will get errors if we don't match the right type. So what seems like a contradiction to that result, I declare another variable result, and then I don't define the type at all. I just don't say what type this should be. Results has to have a type. Every variable has to have a type, and it can only store values of that type, but I didn't define one here. We can get away with this sometimes if there's no ambiguity as to what the type should be. 
Then Scala does what's called infer. It will infer what the type of that variable should be, and then it will create a variable of that type. So for example, the only thing I'm doing when I declare this variable of result is assigning it the, re the resolution of this method call of multiple, multiply by two. Well, Scala looks at multiply by two, looks at my definition and says, well, you guaranteed me that multiply by two returns a double. And with this variable you just created, all you're doing is assigning the return value of a method call of that method. So Scala goes, you know what, I got you. Result must be of type double. I'm not gonna make you type some extra characters when I can figure it out for you. So you can leave off the, uh, the type in that. In most examples, I'll try to always specify my type explicitly. And it's good practice to always state it explicitly just uh, to make your code more readable, just make it more clear what your intent is. Uh, and to make sure maybe Scala infers something that you didn't think it was going to infer, you can get in some real trouble that way and get some really tough errors to debug. Uh, so it's good to state your types. But I wanted to show you one example where Scala can infer the type. Result still has a strong type of double, but I didn't have to type the word double is the only difference. Because Scala was able to figure out that it could only be a double. What else could it be? That method returns a double can't be anything else than a double. All right, any questions on this example before we move on? Yep. Do you always need a parameter for every function? No. Uh, so the question is, do you always need a parameter for every function? You can have a, or a, a method, you can have a method with no parameters. So uh, think of if you have a string and you call dot length on it, you don't have any parameters or arguments for that length call but it still returns something meaningful to you. Uh, and in that case, you would just have open, open print, close print. Any other questions on this example? Moving on to conditionals. So this is the, the last example, third and last example we'll see today. Let's start, let's throw conditionals in there. Let's start combining things uh, a little bit here to show some, uh, some interesting parts of Scala here. So let's combine a method call and a conditional specifically. So this, again, you can probably look at this code without, without studying Scala and kind of reason about what's going on here. We have some thresholds, 60 and 30. If we're above 60, we're going to consider the input. Think of this uh, related to your homework, some package, some weight of a package. And we want to say, well, if a package weighs over 60 pounds, I'm going to call that large. If it's less than 30, I'm going to call it small. If it's in between 60 and 30, I'm going to call it medium. And just classify these packages in some way. I'm going to call this three times. If I call it with 70, 50, and 10, I should get large, medium, small based on this conditional. So let's pick this apart and look at the Scala specific things that we're, we're using here. Talk about a few more topics. A few things that I did differently in this one that I didn't do in the last example. So the first thing you'll notice, I didn't use the keyword var. When I declared large and medium, I used the keyword val for value. So these are not variables, these are values, which means the value stored in them cannot change. Once I assign them a value, that value large of type double is always going to have the value 60. If I try to say large equals 59, Scala's gonna say, can't do it, that's an error. I'm not running your program uh, in, in your, uh, you just can't do it, it won't let you do that. So large and medium are values, the value started them cannot change, and you'll get an error if you try to change those values. Scala will take you seriously on these. If you say, I'm gonna call this a veil because it's not going to change ever, and then you try to change it somewhere, Scott's going to be like, well, you told me that's not going to change, and that's just going to refuse to run your, your program. Uh, and this is similar to constant JavaScript. Yes? A few reasons. One, if you really, if that value changed, if that value changing would break your program, you really need that to always be the same. You would want it a value just so you don't accidentally change it. And so another developer on your team doesn't accidentally change it and then mess up all of your stuff. Uh, the second one would be for efficiency. There's a lot that the compiler can do for you. If it knows that is never going to change, it can 
do a, a more optimization on your code uh, to make it run faster and more efficiently. Any other questions? Good question, by the way. Okay, now our conditional. I don't, really don't have much to say about this conditional. It, it's, I believe, exactly JavaScript syntax. If, and then some conditional, some block of code. Else if, some conditional, some block of code. Else, some block of code. Um, I don't have much to talk about for that one. If you, if you can't follow that one, you probably couldn't follow the JavaScript, uh, JavaScript conditionals either. So I assume everybody's good on this one. But what I want to talk about is combining this conditional with a method call. So here, I have a method that's returning three different things conditionally, but I don't have any return statements. I don't have anything like that. As we mentioned before, the return value of a method is the last, uh, I keep wanting to say statement, the last uh, expression, the last expression evaluated during that method call. Well, here I have a conditional as the last statement of my method call, and the conditional is going to determine what the last expression to be evaluated is. So for example, when I give this a package of size 70, it's going to be greater than large. This is going to be true. This large is executed. It's just a string literal on a line by itself, but this is a valid statement. That statement is executed. And then execution jumps right to the close brace, jumps to this code brace. There's no other, um, there's no other expression to be evaluated in that method, which means large will have been the last expression evaluated in that method call. So large will be the return value of this method call. This method call that returns a string. That's the string that will be returned. When 50 is called, this is false, this is true, this is executed. Nothing else to execute. Medium was the last expression to be evaluated. Therefore, medium will be the return value. And likewise with small, both of those uh, conditionals are false. So the else statement is ran. Small is returned. Uh, small is the last expression, so small is returned. So we're using the fact that methods always return the last expression that's evaluated and leveraging that by putting a conditional at the end of our method to decide what the return value will be just by controlling what the last uh, what the last expression evaluated is going to be that kind of gets us around the the uh, return having to have a return statement if I, I forgot to mention this in an earlier lecture so I got to make sure I mention it here if you don't have an else if you don't have this else here you will get an error you'll get uh, It'll say unit with some underline, and it'll say, why are you returning unit instead of a string here? You told me you were going to return a string. Even if the if and else if, and this happens if I say if input, uh, I've seen this on the, the, uh, the lecture question quite a bit. If input greater than or equal to large, do something. Else if input less than large, do something, and then no else statement. Now I know and you know that that else and that else if are collectively exhaustive. You're not going to get through that if statement without running one of those two unless you're passing null or something strange. Scala will look at that and say, look, I don't care if you've covered every possible double on the planet. You don't have an else statement. I can't be guaranteed that uh, one of those will be true. So I'm going to give you an error. So if you're doing this, using this conditional as your last statement. You have to have the else there. You have to have that or else um, Scala will have no guarantee that one of your if blocks will be executed. If none of them are executed, now we're not returning a string anymore. So if I just didn't have this else, we have no guarantee that a string will be returned. The last expression to be evaluated will be the if statement itself, which won't run any code, which is going to result to unit, which is not a string and you're gonna get an error. So if you see that error, make sure you have an else statement in your, uh, an else clause in your if statement. Likewise, if you have any code after this, so for example, if I put another string back here and said very small after the if statement, it doesn't matter what I input into that method, it's always going to return very small because the string inside my conditional is no longer the last 
expression to be evaluated in the method call. So again, we're just leveraging this one concept. The last expression to be evaluated is the return value. So just thinking about what the implications are of that. And conditionals bring out a lot of implications of that. Uh, and the lack of an else brings in the strict typing. Scala will hold us to the return type of string here. If we don't have an else, Scala has no guarantee that a string will be returned. Uh, so we have a lot of implications of the few things that we've seen today. Okay. Any questions on this <coughs> example? Yep. Yeah. How to make notes in Scala? Uh, uh, like comments? Yeah, like Excuse me. hash like what Python how to do it in Scala. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, double slash or slash star and then star slash for block comments. I mean, I'm going to the ID right now, so let me, uh, I'll do a couple of those. I'll do some comments. And a reminder of the lecture question. I always have the last slide as a lecture question, too. Okay, so let's jump over to Scala uh, and start a new project. I'll do something similar as I did here, but I'll start a brand new project um, to get this done. So let's, once all of your IntelliJ is set up, we'll go to File, New, Project, Scala, Idea, just like we saw in the slides. Next, I'm going to give this some unique name, something better than uh, Untitled 8. I'm going to create a new project. What this does for me is gives me a directory for my project and an idea project. This is just settings for the for ID uh, for IntelliJ itself. Some we, we really don't have to mess around with that folder. But more importantly, this SRC folder, this is where all of our source code is going to go, is in this folder. So let me go in, into this folder. I'm going to right click it. And I want to create a package where my code is going to go. I'm going to name it lecture, like the lecture question. And now I have IntelliJ will create the package and directory. It will treat those as the same thing. It will enforce this package and directory structure are identical. It will enforce that for us. So let me go to lecture. I'll right click this. Go to new Scala class. Example, I guess. Uh, I'm going to give it, oops. Well, I get to show this off anyway, I guess. So I would go to new Scala class. You can use this drop down and select object to create a Scala object instead. If you forget to do that, like I just did, and this, I, I can't zoom in on the sidebar, but I can zoom in in the editor. If you do what I did, you can always just change class to object. And now I have an object instead of a class. We'll talk about classes in a few weeks. We're not there yet, so all objects from, um, from here. OK, so we have our first structure. We have the SRC folder with a directory named lecture. I have this Scala object named example in a file named example.scala. A lot of that setup IntelliJ did for me in that package and in that directory named lecture. Now I need my main method. The main method always has to have the same header. And one thing as computer scientists and programmers we don't want to do is memorize things. That's why we have computers. We get that them to do it for us. IntelliJ has this covered. Just type main and enter. There, I have a main method. You should never memorize that. I don't want you wasting any brain power on memorizing that, uh, that header. Just type main, enter, done. Uh, we really don't need this unless we're doing command line arguments, which, uh, as I said earlier, we're not doing in 116 anyway. So let's not worry about main methods quite yet in your careers. So now let's define a second method. DEF to define a method. I did add three earlier, so let's do add six. Just some silly method that does nothing interesting, but because uh, I'm not creative enough at this moment. Uh, takes an, a, one parameter, I'm going to call it number. I'm going to give it a type, colon, and then the type. Let's have this be an int. I need the return type. I'm going to return an int. I'm going to find the body of this uh, 
uh, of this method. Actually, let's give it a very generic name because I want to do something more than just int 6. I'm going to show a different example. So let's compute something. We're going to take an int and return an int. Let's do something with this int. So right away, you see that we have an error. And this error is saying, hey, your expression of type unit does not conform to your return type of int. It's saying, you told me you were going to return an int, but you didn't. You didn't return an int. What's the deal with this? So I need to return an int. If I just want to shut up the error, I can just add any int. Now this method always returns 0. Not too interesting, but I got rid of my error. So let's throw a conditional in here to make it a little more, more interesting. Uh, if number less than 6, I want to return, I don't know, number plus 6. Else if number greater than or equal to 6, just return number itself. And I want to show this example. Uh, to show the error that I'm going to get when I do this. This is going to give me an error. I cannot run this code. So if I say val x of type int equals compute math of 5, and I want to do print line of x, and I try to run this program, I'm not going to be able to. Let's... Uh, Oh, the comments question. I get to use that. Uh, double slash or block comments are slash star, star slash. So if I want to comment out that code and just return zero, uh, to run this program, IntelliJ gives us a few different options. As long as this is an object with a main method, they'll give us these arrows in the, uh, in the gutter here. We can just click these and it'll run. Or do what I, I'm going to do here. I'll right click and then go down to run to be able to run this program. Uh, it's going to take a, a few seconds. It's compiling. We'll talk next week about what that means. It's compiling my code and then it's going to run it and print out zero to the screen. And then there's a little shortcut. Once you run that, uh, run a program once, you can use this go button in the, on the top. It'll run the last thing that you ran, and it'll rerun that. Um, convenient for, often for testing. All right, so we ran our first program, but we didn't do anything interesting. We just returned zero. That's not going to work. But when I change it to this, I'm going to get that error I was talking about earlier. So this is an error that drives many students nuts. It drives a lot of traffic in office hours. So I want to squash this early if I can. Expression of type any value does not conform to expected type int. So I told Scala I'm going to return an int, and it's saying that I'm not returning an int. But if we look at that conditional, it really looks like I'm going to return an int. Either number is less than 6 or it's greater than or equal to 6. It has to meet one of those conditions, right? Scala will not believe us, though. It's not going to trust that these are collectively exhaustive, exhaustive, we do need an else statement. So even if else just returns some default thing, maybe negative one to say some error happened, it has to have an else statement if we're using a conditional to control the return type in this way. Uh, alternatively, we could, in if and else if, we could store number plus six or number in a different variable and then return that variable after the, the conditional. We can do things like that too. Um, but we have to make sure the last expression evaluated is of type int. If it's not, we're not going to be allowed to run our program. So now we can run this. I'll use this go button. And we should expect 11 here, I hope. And just, I don't want to get too sidetracked with this, but I think I can get this to, I think if we pass null, we'll get that negative one. Just to show that, nope, we, we just get an error. I 
I think we can get that negative one. I'll give it one more try. Nope, I'm not gonna. Anyway, I, I'm pretty sure we can give it some something crazy enough uh, that will trigger that that negative one to be called. And Scala's not gonna trust us. It's it needs that guarantee, that absolute guarantee that the last expression will always be will always be the return type. We'll always match that type. So it's not going to trust our, our conditionals. It's not going to trust that we're collectively exhausted uh, in any case. And really, realistically, what you should do is just this. If, if it's not less than 6, it's going to be greater than or equal to 6. So just put your else instead of an else if. If your else if is collectively exhaustive, just leave off the, the if, leave off the not last conditional. Yes? No, no. So this is not like like Python really cared about white space. Scala does not. Scala is more like JavaScript. It doesn't really care about the white space. Uh, that's why we have our braces everywhere. The braces are going to define where the code blocks are, where they start and end, not the indentation like in Python. Oh. Uh, and so we have our program. We're all happy with it. It's a wonderful program that we're going to submit to Autolab, right? So we go to File. When we want to submit File, IntelliJ has this Export to Zip File option. So we're going to go export this, save it somewhere. Just wherever you save it, just remember where you save it. The, some of the most frustrated I've seen students, and it happens quite often, is they keep saving their zip file but submitting a different one. And they're like, why are the results never changing? It's because they're saving in one place but uploading from a, a different place. And they just keep uploading the same code even though they're saving in another place. Try to avoid that. I know we all make mistakes at some point. It might happen, but, uh, but try to remember where you're saving this. I'm going to save this just in my downloads directory because whatever. Uh, then we go to IntelliJ, or sorry, uh, Autolab. I'm going to go submit my code like we did earlier. Now I have a zip file to submit. I'm going to upload that as the lecture question. And I'm, of course, not going to get credit because you know, I just coded some random stuff. But you're going to get one of two results. You're either going to get a zero, and it's going to say lecture question did not pass all tests, or a one lecture question complete. You're not going to get any other feedback in this course. The auto lab is just there for you to know that, that you have met that objective. You completed that lecture question. The, the first thing we'll talk about starting next week is how to test your own code, how to write unit tests. That is a big, major part of this course. It'll be a major part of all your future courses. They'll, they'll be given less and less feedback. It'll be a huge part of your careers after graduation. You have to be able to test your own code. So I will give you a bit of feedback. You still get to know if you pass all the tests or not. But you're not getting uh, specific feedback beyond that. Any questions with this? See you Friday.